I'm really wanting to thank our speakers for putting so much thought into this and giving us something to, uh, to chew over a bit. That's a technical term, to chew over in our, in our debate. Um, are we good now? OK. So again, what I'm going to do is moderate in the sense of uh, I'll take the questions. You can direct them to whomever on the panel you would like. I'll just repeat it for the benefit of the, uh, of the recording so that your sophisticated, intelligent question will be preserved for posterity and webcast on our website. So open the floor. Jim. Um, I think this is directed at something that you had said, uh, Professor McKay, in that there's, there's sort of an issue of how to widen the scope of, of uh, the privacy threshold in terms of you know, um, online content. I'm, I'm curious as to how, um, so I guess I'll go with an example from my hometown, Moncton, New Brunswick, where a woman was abducted in broad daylight and held for a couple of months. And during that time, all the sort of conventional social media outlets were used to sort of say, where is she? Let's find her. Um, so her picture was, was ubiquitous. You know, you couldn't get away from it on a daily basis. When it finally went to trial, there was a publication ban. Um, so it's, it almost seems like a redundant step. I'm curious as to how the law is going to sort of deal with the fact that you know, nothing's off limits, it seems, with the internet. I'm not well, sure if that's the yeah. question as a, an observation, but... I guess the question is, if we're going to recast privacy law, what do we do about the problem of pre-proceeding publicization, when there's already yeah. information out there, exactly. you know, and, and floating out there on the internet available for gathering? Yeah. Yeah. I guess there's several levels of response to that. In, in a more legal response first, I guess if, in fact, there's no value served in the publication ban because it's already out there in a strictly legal sense, what's the point? But I, I suppose this goes to the broader argument about reconceptualizing what we mean by privacy. Uh, if in fact it's defined more as a human right sort of grounded in a, the dignity of the person, then maybe she could pursue civil actions for the uh, prior exposure and invasion of her privacy, whether that's a good or bad idea. But I think that would probably open that up. Whereas if you took the more traditional definition of privacy, what's a reasonable expectation of privacy? Certainly once it's already her picture and everywhere is everywhere, her reasonable expectations small to none. So on that definition, it's kind of a useless thing. If you look at it as a violation of your personality and your basic human dignity, then the fact that it's already happened doesn't necessarily end it. They can't, she can't ever kind of regain her privacy. I mean, once privacy, especially in the digital world, once privacy is invaded, she can't take it back. But I suppose from a legal way of looking at it, does she maybe have some claims for damages as a result of that privacy invasion? And to get there, I think we have to have a more enriched kind of concept of what privacy is. And that, that's a big jumping off from the AB case, but I think that's a very large issue in the modern world where you know privacy is absolutely under threat at, at all levels, and what, what, if anything, are we going to do about that? So I think it's a good illustration of maybe the value of a broader conception of privacy. And the AB case doesn't directly address <coughs> that at all other than citing this one article I referred to, and they didn't necessarily take it for that point. but. I think it's uh, that raises that broad question. Jim, do you want to jump in? I, I think I'd answer it uh, coming from a different perspective, and I'd say two things. Uh, two things in response to what your question raises. Uh, one of them is uh, instances of uh, tremendous pre-publicity before before the application for the discretionary publication ban. The fact and existence of tremendous pre-publicity is a consideration at the publication ban motion stage. Uh, one of the things a judge or a court will ask itself is whether the information that is sought to be banned is already out there in the public domain. And in fact, you saw that very recently in the Ontario Court of Appeal in the Colonel Williams case, the divorce case. The Ontario Court of Appeal made the point that much of the information that was sought to be banned had already been extensively published. 
Uh, that's one aspect, I think, that, that arises from your question. The other aspect of it is, uh, and it's a constant debate, it's the efficacy of a publication ban uh, in the Internet age. Uh, how, how effective are publication bans uh, when, when the Internet can reach across global borders? I'll tell you that that was a debate that was occurring before the Internet was prominent, and you saw that debate in Bernardo and in uh, Picton in circumstances where that had attracted great American media interest. And uh, the concern in those cases is that the publication bans were not effective against the American media who were broadcasting across border and to a lesser extent distributing newspapers across border, the Buffalo News, for example, in the Bernardo case. Um, and these days the question is constantly being asked, uh, is a publication ban effective in light of the Internet? I think the answer to that is that a publication ban is still effective. And there are different ways to tailor your publication ban relief. If you've got a particularly high-profile case with a possibility for, um, uh, for Internet reporting of the case, there is wording you can use in the relief. And uh, in the case of Picton, the judge was prepared to go so far as to exclude American reporters if necessary. So those are a couple of the, t a couple of the tangents that your question raises, I think. Michelle, any views on that one? No views on that one. Okay. <laughs> so next, uh, Albert. This is one of those uh, <coughs> pretender on the Supreme Court questions. Uh, Mr. Rossiter, I got the impression that you concurred by and large in the result with the decision, but felt that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but thought that a lot of the reasoning behind it, particularly when it came to evidence and judicial notice and the first stage of Dejanay Mentor kept being sloppy. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, it seems that way. Um, how might you have gotten to that result but with tighter evidentiary reasoning. And I also, please, the other two panelists at the end, be more than happy to hear their thoughts on that as well. Okay, just to restate the question is, um, the reasoning process that the court used in A, A B is, uh, we've been talking a lot about judicial notice, how they arrived at the findings that they made. And uh, <coughs> the question is, how might one get there with a more rigorous application of that law of evidence, which you all, you know, really have to take if you haven't taken it already. <laughs> that was a paid announcement <laughs> for evidence law. Look, I'll start where Michelle started a minute ago. Uh, I too credit you with a very good uh, result for your client, uh, and it, and it's and and you're quite right. Uh, I I I don't mind the result. I don't mind that AB's identity was protected in these circumstances. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with that result. Where I, where I, uh, where I, where I'm, where I'm, ha where I have discomfort is I felt that Dejanay and then Mentuck struck an appropriate balance between uh, open course and freedom of expression on the one hand, and um, and and publication ban relief on the other, and I felt that it struck that balance reasonably by requiring evidence in support of a motion. And I think what you had, and the reason I quoted the portions of the decisions of the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia and the Court of Appeal of Nova Scotia, the reason why I selected those particular quotes uh, is that they just very practically indicated uh, an ability to lead some evidence. And if you look uh, specifically at what Justice Saunders said, he wasn't requesting evidence of, which I agree with Michelle, is quite unhelpful. He wasn't requesting evidence of, what, of, of people crystal balling or gazing into the future. Evidence of a, I think he used the word, of a noticeable change in AB. Um, something that was observed by somebody that a judge could then use and say, that's a predictable response to that situation and I predict that, uh, that uh, further, based on that I predict that further publicity will cause your harm. I, I, I just thought Dejanay and Mentuck and the requirement for evidence achieved that balance. Uh, and when I read AB, I didn't get the same sense in reading A.B. that I did in reading Dejeuner that there was a recognition that uh, charter rights are protected equally and are to be balanced. And in fact, uh, in December when I read the, I, I'm sorry if I keep getting the initials wrong, the NS case, is anyone? I think that's right. The NS case, when I read that decision, uh, there it was again, uh, a, a good recognition by the Supreme Court that charter rights are to be that, that no charter right trumps another, that, they, uh, that they're on an equal footing and that they're to be balanced when they're in conflict. Shall you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think if you, your question is, um, can we get the same result in a path that is a little more uh, 
I conventional. Can, I can imagine um, <laughs> a very, very social awkward situation in which uh, three of you and six other people are sitting on the court. You're writing the decision, and you really like everyone to sign it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, there was an opportunity for the court to um, build on the parents' patrie jurisdiction that it has. Uh, it hasn't revisited that for a long time. Um, you know, certainly this situation did not fall squarely within the analysis that existed the last time the court looked at it. But it, I think that jurisdiction. Um, is quite open and malleable, and so you know, could have been used to get you know in through the path that Abella obviously wanted to be on. Um, I think she was on the the conventional path when there was the recognition of the inherent vulnerability of children, and referring to the other places in law that that has occurred. Um, and that would dovetail with parents patriae because it, um, I think, you know, at the very basic level, is to deal with vulnerable parts of people in society, either individually or as a group. So I think those avenues were open, and they're not, you know, the the path that was taken to get to the result. Michelle, can I ask just as a, an observer or you know, like a law geek, interested with what happened at the hearing itself? Was the was the record talked about in terms of judicial notice or in terms of how evidence supported where the parties wanted it to go? What kind of a dialogue? No, it was interesting actually because um, being sort of a everyday litigator, I you know I'm always focused on okay, what does the old decision say? What does the order say? And I put it to the court at one point. I said, well, no, you got to look at the order, and you could see them all kind of looking at me, wondering if they even had it. And so, you know, we flipped to where it was. And so, because there was some talk about, uh, you know, Bragg and, and their, the part that involved them that hadn't been appealed, it wasn't before them. So it, it you know, it felt procedurally like this was uh, unusual, that they, the Supreme <coughs> Court was more concerned about the concepts. But then, to answer your question, the concepts that they, you know, implicitly everyone seems to say relied on, they weren't even front and center at all. It was, uh, it's a great experience, I'll tell you. If any of you get it, it's a week before it's a nail biter, but uh, once you get there, it's like, oh, this is good. I'll do this again tomorrow. <laughs> okay, other questions? Can I just add a. Oh, yes, please just, do. No, sorry. Just, it strikes me, just as you were talking there, Michelle, that maybe it's a quite a clever decision on Abella and the court's part in that it is brief and doesn't name the various cons. I mean, that can go either way. But if she had said, well, now we're doing judicial notice and let me do it in a way that doesn't fit, <coughs> she didn't say that. She never said anything about judicial notice. So it's at least notionally open to a future case. Say, well, that case not about judicial notice. That, we didn't even talk about it there. That's something different. So in a sense, her brevity and perhaps deliberate uh, vagueness on points allowed her to get to a good result without being too caught up in the, the thicket that can be the law. And it may have been strategic. And may I, have. I would agree entirely because the the idea of the Supreme Court. And I'm going to geek out again. The idea of the Supreme Court taking judicial notice has been really controversial because so often the stuff of which they take judicial notice didn't form part of the original evidentiary record. It comes in by way of the parties at the appeal and at at the court by way of interveners. So that's it's almost. I feel like there was a missed opportunity. To, to get back into that, but that's because I'd like to see them talk about it. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. Anyway, enough for me. Here. Uh, if I understand the, the, the case is, uh, what it does is shortcut the evidentiary requirement to get one of these uh, publication bans on the, uh, on the applicant. But if I understand as well, the bar is pretty low to begin with. And that the lower courts have basically said, well, you know, you could have just filed an affidavit. So if it's like a cyberbullying situation, uh, I would think it'd be a matter of just getting, you know, one of the parents involved in the situation to sign an affidavit that says, you know, my, my daughter and my son is really upset by this. Overall, it takes about 10 minutes to swear an affidavit like that. So with that shortcut, or rather that obstacle out of the way, what's the big win out of the case uh, not being to do that? Okay, so the, again, for purposes of cyberspace, the question is, 
what's the what is the big win from the case when if it was easy enough to uh, easy as Justice Saunders suggested it would be to file evidence of harm to the child, then what what have we actually won? And perhaps we'll we'll put that one to the winner first. Sure. Um, well, if there is no harm, you know, none that has occurred in whatever period of time um, has resulted, yet, you know, there's still been a wrong and the victim wants to pursue a remedy without having to re-suffer that wrong. And I mean, you know, suffer using it loosely, but, you know, be the subject matter of broader uh, publicity concerning that wrong. So I think, you know, I hear you. The, the, and the, the affidavits that are in play that I'm familiar with are, you know, not m very difficult <coughs> works of, uh, of, you know, drafting. Um, so, you know, I think the win is uh, for children that it's not about each of their individual um, uh, reaction. I mean, I love this one. It says, now, the law attributes the heightened vulnerability based on chronology, not temperament. So, you know, one victim, 15, cries, uh, you know, is that enough? Or we got crying and refuses to go to school, or crying, refuses to go to school, won't eat. Crying, refuses to go to school, needs psychological counseling. Like, where on that spectrum is it enough? And what this decision did, and I think the win, is it didn't require that subset of analysis that would it eventually unfold had, you know, the, this, the particular requirement for individual evidence uh, remained. Wayne, do you want to? Yeah, if I, if I could just add, it's really an extension of that same point. I think the other, as Jim pointed out, it's a class that are given the exemption, not the individual and the sort of use the tort term, the thin skull rule, as you're just saying, really doesn't apply. So it doesn't matter whether the particular victim was not as troubled or was troubled. And, and I think a, perhaps an equally important point which raises this access to justice point that I was sort of beating on in my, in my presentation is that I think, well, without knowing this, part of the audience for the Supreme Court decision was people thinking about pursuing a claim. You're not, the, not just the claimants in front of them, but if you're a victim of cyberbullying and you're trying to assess whether or not you want to pursue a civil action of defamation, negative, whatever it is, what are the chances that you're going to have to give up your identity to do that? And if, in fact, they have to prove it and produce affidavits and some win and some lose, that's one calculation. If the, yeah. the case says, as it does, I think, it, you don't have to prove any of that. If you're in the right age category, and you've been victimized by cyberbullying, you will get your anonymity. So they say, yeah, well, I'm going for it then. So, and I think in a way, Abella is quite explicit about saying this, that she wants to not have the chilling effect for the real victims who then cannot and will not pursue their claims because of further victimization. So she takes all of that, even if most of the time they win, even if they lose occasionally, that may make people say, well, I'm not going there. I, I, it's not worth it to me to be re-victimized, but she's settled that on, for the whole court, saying as long as you have the age category, as long as you're victimized at least by sexualized cyber ruling, take the narrowest, then you're home free. I agree with everything Wayne said, except that what he would characterize as the big win, I would characterize as the big loss. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently. Two gets one. <laughs> John? Sure. Um, so I have a question. It's more of a, maybe a, a theoretical question about privacy in general. So uh, I'll direct it towards Professor McKay, but I welcome any other comments. Um, I get the sense that you're a, a fan of the Elvis uh, article and uh, this notion of reconceptualizing privacy. And I'm, I'm also sympathetic to uh, what uh, she's attempting to do in the article although I'm a bit skeptical about some of her recommendations. So for example, she, this notion of uh, reconceptualizing privacy, um, I, in my view, and I've you know, written this elsewhere, I think privacy has been overseer theorized. It's been, there's this rich and deep uh, wealth of, of legal scholarship on privacy, both in Canada and the United States, which has you know, reconceived and reconceptualized privacy so, for so many contexts, it's actually been so sliced and diced for every bit and type of privacy that 
I think we've done enough at that point. Um, and in terms of uh, linking privacy to human rights and this notion of dignity, uh, there's also a, a large body of scholarship that's been doing that. It's been linked that way for a while. And in fact, if you look at it, Eltis cites the fact that, you know, typically discussions in common law jurisdictions about privacy, you go back to the Warren and Brandeis, the famous article written in the 19th century. Um, if you go back to that, they actually link privacy to personality. They actually explicitly talk about dignity in that context. Um, in my view, I think before we go back to re reconceptualizing privacy, we need to actually theorize ourselves in these spaces, in the sense that we need to think critically about how uh, we, how technology is sort of altering us in our own behavior. So that that's a whole different set of uh, theoretical questions and empirical questions. So I was thinking, um, uh, given your work on the commission, whether you found any hard empirical evidence that it's true. And I know there's a lot of people uh, make these claims about the net generation and you know, the digital natives and that sort of thing. I'm skeptical about these claims given the little bit of empirical evidence out there. But, but I, I was wondering if you found that children are reconceiving themselves in different ways uh, in light of the technology that they're using, in light of their time they spend on the internet, um, and whether you think that there's any uh, useful avenues for more research and investigation. So then, you know, any thoughts on that? You know, is it more, uh, this is just one provincial task force, does there need to be a bigger inquiry, does there need to be more empirical research? Maybe your thoughts on any of that would be, would be okay. welcome. I'm looking forward to Rob's uh, short summary. <laughs> 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 First and then I'll try to research. I'm not answering this, let's just say no. <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> In 40 seconds or less. So my colleague, Professor Penny, has suggested that the view expressed in the Eltis article that, that Professor McKay was discussing earlier might be putting the cart before the horse a little bit in the sense that we need to inquire into reconceptualizing ourselves before we make the further step of reconceptualizing and re-theorizing privacy law. That was the first point. The second point was a, was a question to Professor McKay. I'm, I'm not doing justice mm -hmm. to Professor Penny's uh, talk here, but the second was a question to Professor McKay in terms of what did he see in terms of the need for that uh, during the hearings that the Cyber Bullying Task Force went for. Are young people as different? Do we need to reconceptualize ourselves as beings entitled to privacy? Thank you. Been, you. Great reinterpreter, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> you did a great job. Well, uh, let me start with the last point, I guess. And first of all, I think you're right. And I, I, as much as I like the Eltis piece, I think there's a few parts that didn't fit together that well. And that, in a sense, she was being a little unfair to the kind of common law perception in the way you said. And I didn't fully understand to the extent she thought the civil law had the other. But, and so there were a few loose, ed less loose ends of that kind. But on your more important question, I guess, I, I would be, first of all, I'd be inclined to agree that the more interesting and in many ways more important question generally getting us outside the world of law is, is to what extent has technology and social media changed who we are and that there was a fantastic kind of glimpse and not much more of that because this is all time limited and a few other things like teaching at the law school that I tried to do at the same time but that uh, that question is not fully answered, and, and you're right, there's a kind of a, a general assumption that there's digital natives and uh, digital immigrants and that they're drastically different. I think there's still a lot of similarities. And one of the questions which uh, would be really interesting to explore empirically would be, for example, is there an age or gener generational difference on how important privacy is, however we conceptualize it? Like, you know, my guess, and it's nothing more than a guess, would be that people of my generation or a few back even, would have a greater attachment to privacy than younger people. That given how they've grown up in the digital age and Facebook and tweeting and Twittering and all these kinds of things, which the young people had to educate us about on the task force, uh, that they aren't as concerned about sharing information, and some of that's excellent. Not always as aware as they should be of the risks of doing that, hence all the problems with cyberbullying and so on. But at the core, I'm not yet convinced, I certainly haven't seen any evidence, that they are fundamentally different, that they really don't care at all about privacy. I, I kind of find that hard to believe. Like, a, you know, take an extreme case. If you're a 
a young, more likely male, who is constantly looking at pornography online, you probably care whether that becomes public or not, at least in certain contexts, right? Whether you're adult or young or whatever you are, or if you're doing something else. And so it's easy to say they just aren't concerned about privacy anymore. I don't think that's true. And maybe this is going to your point. It's really not just about redefining the legal concept of privacy, because we don't actually solve world problems by legal concepts as much as we'd like to think so. But rather, you know, thinking about, you know, what is the nature of the world out there? I mean, what, you know, what are people really, what do they value and where does privacy fit in that? And how significant is it? And then, equally important, law trying to catch up with technology and social change. I mean, you know, Rob and yourself and others, there's people that are paying attention to law and technology and how it's changed and everybody has to to some degree. But I think my sense is we're still way behind uh, in terms of legal concepts and legal ideas and the world in which we now live where social media and technology is a part of everyday life constantly. So I haven't really fully answered, but I, I guess to say I think there does need to be more study and there's a little bit on this, I haven't read much of it, and a really interesting question, to what extent are not just young people, but to what extent are we different in the Blackberry, Crackberry world? You know, to what extent are we different because we're attached to these machines and, you know, have we lost our attention spans? Have we become multitaskers to the point that we can't focus? What damage has been done to our brains? I don't know. But interesting questions. <laughs> we'll see what happens to RIM over the next year or so, whether we will be in a crackberry <laughs> yeah, world, exactly. world anymore. Uh, maybe time for one or two more. Alan? Okay. Um, hopefully for a question, uh, two part question. Uh, did the court consider uh, a <coughs> concept of the right to privacy with the right to anonymity that's uh, incompatible with the reality of the internet? The second part of that is, is there a danger in undercutting even slightly media rights for what is Okay, question uh, two, well, two, not a two-part question, but two questions. The, sorry, can you restate the first one, Alan? My attention span gets short in the afternoon. <laughs> were, were concepts of privacy conflated with concepts of anonymity? Yes, did the court, and, and did the court conflate privacy with anonymity here in terms of both the, yeah, the, the, the ruling and its effects, okay. And the second question was. Is there, is there a danger in undercutting media rights or in the context of cyberbullying, which could be Okay, are the protections on, on media rights and freedom of expression being undercut by, by moral panic having to do with the ubiquity of the internet and attack on privacy and that sort of thing? Do you have a, a panelist you want to start with or throw it wide open? I'll start on the first one. Um, you know, I think the, well the court didn't specifically say this anonymity order is for privacy reasons. Um, the, the upshot of it is exactly that. Um, but, you know, I don't, I'm looking over at David Fraser, who's our, the privacy expert at our firm, and who whenever I have a privacy question or thought I go to, but, uh, you know, it, it just, it didn't really come front and center. I think it was kind of the, the underlying um, it issue. The, I would say it was the result, but it wasn't the path. Yeah, was and it was kind of the unspoken concept that was kind of sitting out there, but no one really addressed head on. My interpretation of AB is that it is a privacy case, that it was relief sought for the purpose of uh, privacy. There was, there was uh, Dejeuner, which was relief sought for the purpose of fair trial rights. There was Mentuck, where you had relief sought for the purpose of criminal justice rights or criminal justice interests. You had Sierra Club, which is where relief was sought for the purpose of protecting com commercial, confidential commercial information and uh, what you were missing. And I suspect one of the reasons why the Supreme Court accepted this case uh, for appeal is what you were missing is that sort of final Supreme Court authority specifically, um, you know, on the specific, uh, specifically on um, privacy as a justification for a, a publication ban. Uh, I don't know whether the word privacy was, was used specifically. I guess I just assumed in reading it that that was the purpose for the ban. That was the countervailing interest, if I can put it that way. Um, so, I, so yeah, I think, uh, I think the pursuit uh, or the grant of anonymity was specifically to protect her uh, privacy rights. But more than that, uh, I, I hasten to add, I mean, our courts, including our Supreme Court of Canada, have, have consistently said that privacy alone 
will not justify a publication ban. Uh, but privacy, along with uh, a risk of harm, will justify a publication ban. And so the reason why you didn't see too much discussion of privacy in this case, I think, is that it was assumed. It was assumed as the purpose for the relief. It, the case was really about uh, uh, the risk of harm. Mm. But I, I see privacy as the, the method of preventing the harm, yeah. right? So. Yeah, that, that's right. That was uh, it, it, that's right. It, uh, you needed anonymity in order to avoid the, the what, what was claimed as the risk of harm. I would agree with that, but add, uh, being a broken record here, my access to justice point. I would say that the real between the lines decision of Abella and the Supreme Court is to protect the right of victimized people to have access to court and legal remedies. Privacy is the vehicle for that, and the harm is the vehicle for that. And at some point, she does kind of state that, and she cites uh, with approval the kids' help phone, and that's clearly the kids' help phone factum and, and submission was very much on that. So in, in sort of echoing something Michelle said earlier, one of, there's so many, many interesting dimensions to this case, but one of them is, is always kind of the judicial method and what they're really trying to do here. And on one level, one can quite legitimately critique the sort of legal tidiness of what Justice Abella and the court did, but or at another level, you could say masterful attempt to get a good result and really uh, stay focused on the ball. This is really about victims of cyberbullying who are significantly harmed, who if we decide the other way will not pursue legal remedies. So that to me is ultimately, it, it wasn't stated in that way and that what's one of the things that interested me about the Altus piece was in a way it's open court versus not so much private but access to courts. Open in what sense? Open to the media, open to the general public, open to the most vulnerable victims who otherwise will not use that court. And in some ways, cleverly, I guess I would give them the benefit of the doubt, she kind of said that without making it front and center because that would really depart from all of the sort of traditional language. So to me, privacy is the vehicle to access to courts and real legal remedies in this case. It does make me think of the conversation we had earlier in this question that's on the mind of law and technology followers. You know, are we different because of the ubiquity of technology? Are our kids different? Do they think differently about privacy? Well, I'm thinking Michelle's client doesn't think any differently about privacy than anybody else. What what we see are the implications, but perhaps it's not that much different yet. Okay, last question up in the corner. I think that's an, yeah, it's an astute observation, again, just to, to restate it, that this, uh, this isn't a departure from things that we've thought about in the past in terms of when situations in which we might want privacy, sexual violence of any kind and the impact on that person probably doesn't tell us a whole lot about what young people or what anybody think about privacy in other areas because this is such a core human cost kind of, kind of uh, situation. So on that note, I think it is time to wrap up. But before we do, I do want to have a, a law professor moment and just <laughs> underscore um, how pleased I am that we are able to have here at the law school speakers of this quality, of this kind of authority, uh, three nationally recognized uh, practitioners in their various fields. Michelle has made Lexpert uh, top 30 under 30 and top 40 under 40. And 
She's still 39 as far as yeah. I know. So, uh, <laughs> looking forward to the next 10 years. Uh, Wayne McKay is a nationally and internationally recognized human rights scholar and award-winning teacher. Jim Rossiter is uh, far too modest a man in terms of the, uh, the authority of this wonderful book that he's written and that if you have money to spend on it, you should buy uh, for certain. And for us to be able to bring this kind of expertise to the school allows us to keep engaging with the real world uh, impacts, the real world effects of the law. You know, the allegation is that law schools are, are in the ivory tower, that we don't deal with the real world. And if you needed an, an example of where we try to bring it all together, this is so. But we could not do it without the very valuable and precious time of people like this. So I'm going to give our speakers gifts on behalf of the Institute. Uh, non-technological gifts that involve chocolate. <laughs> Good. And we have, on behalf of the school and the institute, but before I do, I hope you'll join me in thanking them.